just sort of start off with a little bit of thinking about quantification in our journals and encouraging students to 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 do that. Um, has anybody seen the 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 post that I put up recently on uh, on tracking the solstice? Tracking the solstice. Roseanne, you got that. So the um, what it is, is um, on the 20th, it's going to be the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. And so what I am uh, encouraging people to do is in their journal to create this, this grid across the bottom with their, actually, I'm going to jump over to a... Uh, a document camera, um, a, a grid, here we go, and I think I may have figured out some clever things on making the document camera work a little bit better. So in the past I've had blurry camera, um, but I'm hoping today, um, video settings, enable HD, yes. We're gonna see if this works. Um, let, and I hope that this won't be laggy. And so I, I, today will be the big challenge if I have successfully, um, we'll see, that looks reasonably um, high resolution. All right. Um, so check this out. Uh, what I've got, is a, a across the bottom, I've got from zero to 180 to 360 on the other side. Um, this is a 360 degree landscape drawing of sitting in the playground near my house. Um, and what I'm going to be doing, uh, and also notice I've got 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 90 degrees uh, going up my page. On the solstice, I'm going to be out at dawn, out at dawn, and record where the sun comes up and where it sets. And um, that, um, so at different times during the day, I'm going to be able to get the elevation and the um, and the degrees north-south of where that is. And I've got a, a blog post kind of giving people instructions about how to do this, but I think this is a great example of a place where you can really just play deeply with, with numbers. From um, the degrees of arc, the 360 degrees, um, degrees up into the sky, um, and what I, um, in the instructions that I have, I teach people um, how to kind of measure degrees up into the sky and also even get into ways of calculating that by measuring shadows using trigonometry. Um, so I want to encourage people to uh, get in there on the, uh, to, to set yourself up a template like this. Again, I've got all the instructions of how to do that. On my on my website, and then to, to to play with these numbers. The reason I think that this is uh, the the reason that I think that this is important is that numbers are numbers are an incredibly powerful, flexible language to help us explore all sorts of different phenomena around us with a, with a higher level of precision. A lot of us got turned off by math early on because we were taught mathematics simply as calculation. And you have to get good at calculating things. Um, so it was how fast can you come up with your multiplication tables and, and drilling those sorts of things. Instead of thinking about mathematics as a way of thinking and describing the universe that you're in, 
Um, so teaching mathematics as calculation is akin to teaching language through drilling spelling and grammar. So if you learned about literature through learning rules of grammar and spelling and never really got to play with books and ideas, the whole endeavor would seem yucky, right? Um, and, but that unfortunately is the way that a lot of people are introduced to and trained to deal with mathematics and numbers. So one of the things which we can do as nature journaling educators is help people reconnect with numbers. There are numbers that are around us all the time and we don't have to be afraid of them. Um, some of us, because of our, the way that we kind of initially engaged with math, um, some of us uh, became, you know, really dislike things with numbers. I've seen some people say like, no, I don't think I want to get, you know, put quantification in my journal because, you know, it just sort of takes the life out of it, right? And I think that's really a reflection of how math has been described to us. So um, what I try to do is to try to get students to see what are ways that we can start to find more numbers in the environment around us and start to include those in our journals. And I'm going to give you um, uh, a, a, a few examples. Um, and, and then what I'd like to do is hear from other people, other thoughts of ways that you, ideas that you might have about how to help people incorporate numbers and also to kind of make playing with numbers more relevant. So the easiest way to start to get numbers into your book is just to start counting things. So you could say there's a lot of birds that are coming to my feeder right now. Okay, but a lot can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So rather than allotting your birds, um, we can, you know, or people will say that, like you, you look at these old accounts of naturalists coming and, you know, looking at the skies and all the passenger pigeons. They say that the skies were filled with countless passenger pigeons. The plains were filled with countless buffalo. Um, people go up to Lower Klamath Wildlife Refuge now in the winter time and they'll say, you know, the sky was filled with countless ducks, geese, and swans. But they're actually meaning profoundly different things with all of these countless things. So um, instead of saying countless, um, we can start counting them. So the easiest way is just, just start counting things and say that there were um, this, this, this morning, there were 20 birds at my feeder, right? Um, or 22 birds at my feeder. And we can get even more specific with that because over what period of time that there were 22 birds that came to my feeder in five minutes, right? It kind of just gives you, you, you then have an idea of the rate of, of bird activity in um, at, at, at your feeder at, at that time during the day. And that is much more useful than a lot of. So, and if you can't count something, the next best thing to do is to try to estimate it. So what you can do is you can say, all right, there were about 20 birds, or you could even give a range. There were 15 to 20 birds at my feeder when I woke up this morning. Um, that, uh, when you give a range, people know that you're estimating and they know that there's some wiggle room there. And it gives a sense of how much wiggle room you think you had. And we can do this also when we're writing numbers. Like let's say you look out at a field of, of geese and you say there were, um, there were 50 geese out there. So, when you are estimating, what you want to do is you're going to be using rounding 
So um, a really useful strategy for estimating numbers is to kind of go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, right? There's 10, 20, 30, 40, 40, 50, about 50, about 50 out here. So you're kind of counting by, 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 by groups of 10. If that's the way that you're counting, then what you want to do is whenever you're writing your numbers in, you want to keep that level of precision in your notes. So if I count about 50 birds and then I see three more show up, I don't write there were 53 birds because that implies that I was going one, two, three, four, five, and counting all those birds. I say there are about 50 birds there. Um, that is a very, very useful strategy. Um, so I can count things, I can time things. If you have a watch and the bird dives under the water, how long does an anhinga stay underwater? On average, is it longer or is it shorter than the time that a cormorant stands down? So if you're in a place in Florida and you've got anhinga and you've got cormorant and they're diving around, they go underwater, you start click, 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 and you wait till they pop up again. And what, what I do with my daughters is when a bird dives is we have a breath holding contest with the bird. And we go And then they start cheating by going But <laughs> that's okay. Um, and so we, we see um, you can start to get an idea of how long these things, these, these things happen. Um, if you have a watch, and a ruler, you can also do, a little slug is crawling across the ground. And you can put your pencil down next to the slug, time it for a minute, put another pencil down at the point that it is, measure that distance. You now have distance centimeters per minute. Um, so that, instead of saying, the slug was moving slowly. And what you're gonna do is you're just gonna start to train yourself to find numbers in the environment around you and to get those into your journal. This project with um, mapping the solstice is filled with numbers and if you go online you'll even see how to use trigonometry to estimate degrees up into the sky, the angle of the sun. Um, and there's a simpler sort of body mechanics way of measuring it if you don't want to do trigonometry. Um, but I recommend that you do because what was the last time you did trigonometry? Right? This is a chance to kind of dust that off and I give you all the instructions and how to do it. You get out the trig, the, the, the uh, tangent table and, and, and you start using that again. You're like, oh wow, this is actually kind of cool. I like that somebody sat down and figured this out. That's really, really fun. Math is, math is as beautiful as the world that it describes. And so when you start to appreciate that, you're going to see that you have more opportunities for um, more opportunities for playing with those sorts of things in your journal, right? Um, let's, I want to invite people now to unmute themselves. And um, if anybody has, I'm going to also unpin my cancel the spotlight video. So the way this should work is if you start talking, um, it's gonna, the screen is gonna jump over to you. If two people start talking at the same time, just we'll just try to be polite and give other people a chance to do things, but somebody's gotta talk. Um, and my general question is, what have been some ways that you find numbers or quantification useful and how do you reflect some of that quantification in your journal? And if nobody has any ideas, um, that will be sad. Um, but I will have some other kind of tricks and things to show you. But what are some other things we can do with numbers? Or does anybody have a journal page where you look down and like, oh, I've got some numbers here. And how did you, how did you show quantification of things perhaps on a journal page? One of the things that um, I kind of remember to do from my high school biology, believe it or not, 50 years ago, but um, uh, to, to measure something that, in a group or the, that's moving, you know, a fast moving group of something or something that's 
occurring quickly is just take like a marker and every time the event happens or every time you notice a bird or, a, or, or something, you just make a mark on the paper and you just keep making those dots until uh, the event is over and then you can just count the dots. You know, that, that might be one way to give a, a, a kind of, you know, it, it's only as accurate as, you know, your, your marking, but uh, it might help uh, help quantify a, an event. Yep. That, that's a, Timothy, that's a, a very good, a, a, a very good idea. So real time collecting data with dots or, or hash marks, um, that is, uh, that's a useful, a useful strategy. Thank you. I've used numbers by counting flower petals so I can do a little research and find out what I'm looking at. Um, yeah, how many people have had the experience of you draw a flower and partway through the drawing you realize it has more or fewer petals than you thought it did and showing your drawing? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, botanists are really good counters. If you're keying anything out, you're often counting, you know, you're counting carpels, counting sepals, counting petals, counting stamen, counting um, how many branches are on the, uh, the, the stigma. Um, so in our descriptions, in our descriptions, intentionally getting those numbers, very, very good thing. So yeah, thank you, Loretta. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I don't know if this will. Re yes, yes. I went to Chicago for four days, and one of the things that happened was everyone got sick. So I ended up drawing a graduated cylinder to indicate how much water we were each supposed to be drinking to kick the virus. It was it was a lot of water. Oh. <laughs> kind of oh, nature. <laughs> Little bit numbers. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. Um, could, could you hold that up, up one more time and, and just hold it very still? All right, so there's the bean, but on the, where my fingers are, there's a graduated cylinder and a discussion of drinking water and a virus particle, and then the house and the trees and the snow and things like that. Oh, nice. Nice. So there, what, um, what I'm taking from, um, <laughs> From, from your strategy here is mm -hmm. that you're, you're turning this number into also a visual to help you An object. Kind of, um, remember it. It's all it. visual for me. Yeah. And so you're kind of sketch noting anytime there's a number that pops up, you're just, you're turning that, you know, how can I turn that into, into a visual? And you're also there by training your brain to, always think about numbers in different ways. Right? Instead of Arabic numerals being the number, you're training yourself to think of it's a volume, here's a graduated cylinder, and then that's also going to help kind of, you know, get into your brain sort of the iconography of showing volume. And another time when you're making a quick sketch note of something, you need volume, boom, there's this little graduated cylinder, beep, and, and you go, I like that. So, I, I, again, she's, how do I silence this? Oh, yeah, it's that little button there. All right. Um, any other strategies or ideas? Yeah. Compare the bird's wingspan to my arm span. Compare the bird's height to my height. Ooh. Nice. Uh, so, w what Robin is, is saying that if you don't have Let's say, you, you, let's say you're out there, you don't have a ruler. How can you measure? You measure relative to some known thing. And so, you know, that can be your, your arm span. And later on, you can figure out what your arm span is. I mean, it, you know, you used to build things using this measurement here. So architects used to use cubits to build things. So the cubit was was that distance there. Unfortunately, different architects had different length cubits. Um, but your own sort of knowing what your own cubit is, 
you've you've got a general range of the size of this of something, and you uh, later on can measure your own cubit or arm span. Um, let me show you. I'll just do a little demo down. Um, so I like really like what Robin was suggesting about. Um, so let, let's say you have, um, you're, you've got a tree, right? And here is your tree. Um, something that uh, botanists will often do in a little drawing, very much like Robin is suggesting, is that they'll, they'll have in a botanical illustration, you know, here's a detailed drawing of what the, the, the leaf looks like, here's what its fruit looks like, here's the cross section of the fruit, you know, here is a diagram of the flower or whatever, but over here by this little tree drawing, they will often put in a little stick figure. Right? And the minute you see that little stick figure, you know roughly how big that tree is. This actually ends up being a little bit more useful than something that says, you know, this is, you know, this distance is two meters. Because then our brains start figuring out, like, okay, two meters, what does that really look like, you know? But the minute you see this little character next to the tree, all of our brains immediately go, um, so this is very much like what Robin is saying, with using your body as a measuring tool, and you can include that 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 in there. Um, so some object of kind of known size in there for something like a leaf. Leaf, you know, you can write in that this is, um, you know, that's eight centimeters, right? But on something like this. Very often that little character down there is more useful than, than a number because it says, you, know, you kind of, you get an idea that this is roughly this big. And that's actually the way you want to be thinking about tree height because, you know, the tree right next to it is not going to be, you know, trees are, they're around a certain height instead of, it kind of gets you, not thinking as specifically, kind of thinking you know, generally a person. Um, and then if you want to, you can, as you're doing these things, adding in your little characters, you can draw them holding a sketchbook and so this little one has a journal here. So you can actually start to include yourself, yourself in the pictures, which is also kind of fun to do. Robin, I like your idea of using um, sort of measurements, using some form of, 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 of measurement that is your kind of your biometric to, to, to do that. Great. Um, another, um, another way that I use measuring in a similar way is with proportions. Um, so you can say, okay, well, how many heads if you look at the head of a bird, how many heads would fit into the length of the tail and so on. So you're comparing one part of your object to another, and that will make sure that your proportions are accurate. That's really good. On, on, yeah, on a, on a bird, you see a little bird up there on a branch somewhere, and um, you, you're, you're trying to figure out is you, you want to have some relative measurement size of this. Um, for how big is the head relative to the body, you can't get your protract, your, um, your micrometer out there and measure that bird that is sitting up there on the tree. Instead, she, what she's saying is use some part like head length. My head is, my body is two heads, all right? So one, two, okay, good. And it actually has a three head tail. One, two, three. Oh, I need to make that longer. Okay, so you, she's, you, can, you can use some kind of known distance 
to, to, de to describe that. Sometimes, um, and then for how big the entire bird is, I have a real hard time on a distant bird. Is that, um, is that 14 centimeters? Um, or, you know, is that a seven inch bird? Who on earth can say? But if you can say it is, um, so the size is less than a robin, right? So it's a little bit less than a robin. Um, or it's a little bit larger than a robin, right? So using a robin, a sparrow, a duck, um, or a chicken um, as, as sort of as, as measuring points, you can say that, you know, that, that bird was a little bit larger than a chicken. And that gives you, that is measurement. It is, um, instead of, because you've, you've got something that you can measure against, even though there's a range of sizes of chickens, it gives you a level of specificity that is in keeping with the level of the, sort of the detail of the information that you have. Love it. Let's keep going with this. What else do we have? How about mapping? I haven't used it, but I bet some people in this group have used mapping and math. Oh, um, Roseanne, do you have handy any of your maps? Mary? Uh, yeah. Let me, I can go grab. Okay, we're going to send uh, Roseanne off on a map hunt. Um, yes, so, so, so mapping, um, you're often thinking about sort of the distances and spaces. And in a journal, we cannot be precise. We cannot be, you don't, there's, there's, no, um, there's no requirement that distances have to be exact but it does get you intentionally looking for those things and putting in a scale, um, whether you're doing that by saying that this is you know, 10 meters, or here's a, I'm going to put a little person on the map or a building on the map or a car on the map so you know how big that is. Oh, let's, let's go to Heather's. Let's go check out Heather's. Check out this Heather page. Um, I'm going to um, spotlight Heather's page. Um, I did a map of one of my favorite walks, and I did it in steps, so I knew um, to the end was about a thousand. Um, it takes about 10 minutes to walk all of it, and so then I divided it up based on the docks, and I knew there was a road that bisected it that was about here, and then about here is a tree where a heron usually nests, and then uh, at the end, there's a little spot that the kids all love that has a swing and, and it's called a fairy tree. And so that was the, um, the map that I had done of the a path that's near my house. Oh, this is wonderful. And I love also how you kind of play with space and perspective here, having the butterfly right up close to us. And then in the background, there is that map. Um, that just having that little piece at the top that says 100 steps is about this. That's all you need to sort of show that there's, that you are conveying spatial information here. So without that little 100 steps, the amount of data goes way down. So you just, you increased your data content a lot by that. And is that a little north indicator in the corner there too? Yeah, I forgot there was, there was somebody who, who liked having that. So, so I, I put in yeah, the little Great. indicator. And there was a book that I just bought on Amazon and, and haven't had a chance to really get into yet, but there was a really fun book that was on sale for, for how to make maps. So if you kind of look around, there's a lot of fun resources. Uh, once you have a chance, uh, Heather, of really checking out that book, um, let us know what you think about it. Um, maybe that's, and if it's something that you really like, um, could you just kind of put a little review of that up on Nature Journal Club Facebook group? Um, I think that a lot of people would be really interested in. in, in yeah, it looked it, it looked like a lot of fun. The other couple of things that I had done that's it's not quite map related, but and this was a different thing. But um, I did a picture as I would see it through binoculars. 
Although that's that's not really numbers related. Anyway, I just thought. But it's cool. fun. I, I like that. That's really playful, really creative. Um, some of the other things that I do are like to um, to document the the weather. You know, you can do like a. Where was it? I did. I was lazy and I don't have an alarm clock, so I had wanted to figure out what the shadows on the wall look like, and could I use those shadows to figure out what time it was. Oh, and so this is the this is, is the the light that cracks through the shadows, and and I put the weather because that was a you know a big indicator. And so this was a while back that I was trying to do. Just try to how do you map the weather? How do you do? I mean, we do a lot of stuff that's we we have to be inside a lot now. So I was trying to figure out what could I, what can I map from my window? What can I see? And what can I think about? Yeah, some things like temperature, wind speed, are. Uh, you know, you you can quantify those. Um, I have uh, I have a thermometer. I have a I actually have a little propeller driven wind speed meter. Um, another way of 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 quantifying something like wind is uh, let's see here. John, you still have Heather highlighted. We can't see you. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, okay. Thanks. Hi, Heather. Uh, so we'll we'll un we'll unpin um, Heather, not to make you self conscious or anything. Not at um, all. And let me go to this. Check this out. Um, now this over here on this page is the Beaufort wind scale. And Beaufort wind scale was developed by Admiral Beaufort, actually when he wasn't an admiral, before he became an admiral. Um, it was a way of kind of quantifying wind speed out on the ocean so that you would know where to trim your sails. So the original one was entirely, um, you know, what the waves and water are doing. And subsequently, people have added to that with um, uh, added to that with uh, you know what what things on land are doing. But you'll see that there's a big kind of nautical emphasis um, in the Beaufort wind scale, and it's a scale from one from zero to twelve. Um, I stopped in the, the, this. This is the little. A quantification handout that I have in the back of, of my journal. It's a free download off my website. Um, and I only put it up to, 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 to eight because after you've got gale force winds, um, you, you've, got, you've got bigger problems. You probably better run inside. Um, <laughs> that just sort of saved me some room. But here are other things that I have there for, for, for quantifying. So that helps you kind of get a wind this is this helps you kind of this table of dots helps you when you're estimating what does a hundred look like, what does five hundred look like. Um, protractor helps you look at angles. A um, a ruler, of course, and then I also have my um, a little a few of my uh, other biometrics of mine. Um, this is. Um, in when I take one step, I am going 0.85 of a meter. So um, in 10 steps, I'm going 8.5 meters. And um, it takes me 11.7 steps to go 10 meters. So I can walk around and use my pace to help me kind of quantify things. So in addition to saying how many steps does it go from here, I could actually turn that into to, to meters. Um, this little system down here is a way of using your hands to measure degrees of arc across the sky. How high is the sun in the sky? You hey, Jack, can you, can you scoot that up? You're, there you go. Right there. How high is the sun in the sky? Um, so um, for the, the solstice event, uh, one of the things that people are going to be doing is recording how high in the sky the sun is at different times and the direction. So direction you can get with, with, a, with a compass, um, but for how high in the sky, 
you hold your shoulders square to the um, to, to the, the so the sun is facing you, and you take your fist at with a straight arm and put it right on the horizon, and that height at that distance is ten degrees going up into the sky. So ninety degrees is directly over your head. So you go ten, twenty, thirty. 40, kind of one potato, two potato, three potato, four. Um, and you count your potatoes up and you get degrees of arc in the sky, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's another kind of bit of quantification. Now, Roseanne, could we uh, pin you and have you show us some of the map craziness that you have been up to? I'm going to stop. Sure. Um, also wanted to ask a question. Um, Carol had a question earlier about the, sol the solstice project. And the question was, is it specific to, can you do this at other times or is it, only, you know, that it, would that be a useful thing to do? Not at solstice. Yes, um, you can do it at other times. You can do it anytime. Um, and you'll get an understanding of how the sun moves, moves across the sky. But if we do it on the solstice, and if a bunch of us do it simultaneously, then we'll have a bunch of people at different latitudes, all doing the same day in the same data set. And also when we do it on solstices, we get the most, the greatest extremes of what the sun can do in the sky. So if you do this at this solstice and the winter solstice, the, the, or the, uh, so the June solstice and the December one, I shouldn't say winter because if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, um, of course, that's your summer solstice. Um, the, uh, you're going to have the full range of what the sun can do in the sky. And the, and the equinox is the, the one that is in the middle. So you have solstice in one extreme, solstice in the other extreme, and then the two equinoxes in the same place in the middle. Um, so that's why we're doing it on the solstice to kind of capture what the extreme is of sun position in your specific latitude. Right? Um, and you can do this anytime, but I think it becomes especially cool at the solstice and that also ties you into all of your ancient ancestors who used to really track this stuff our early agriculturalist ancestors were all about uh, it was a matter of life and death to know when the solstice and the equinox were because you would time parts of your agricultural cycle based on those event on those key events Okay, so I've got two things I can throw up here. I think I can share my screen here. Yes. Sure. Okay, so this is uh, mapping uh, animal behavior. So um, instead of just drawing the Costas hummingbird, um, I was watching what he was doing and decided to do a view from above and map there. Uh, map his behavior and what trees and how far apart he was flying um, and how often and then how his head was swiveling. So there's sort of a lot of different actions in there. Um, so it was, it was more interesting, I think, than just the pro just writing what he was doing. Um, you get a complete look and you get an idea of what plants were around him on uh, that. So that was kind of fun. Um, and now I'm going to try, I'm going to try, um, see if I can do this little advanced thing here. No, I don't know. Is that working? Nope. Um, nope. So that didn't work. Um, I'll do it the old fashioned way then I'll just hold it up. I was trying to use my, my iPad as a, a document camera. So that is mapping bird song um, throughout the day from dawn till dusk, from before dawn till dusk. And 
they're that they're in height above the ground based on what I was perceiving as the frequency of the of the call so that the highest frequency and then the lowest frequency across time and then you can see right in the middle there I caught some burdens mating so I put a little heart symbol <laughs> so that was fun Unmute. I can't unmute you, Jack. You you muted yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, so she's uh, noticed she's using four letter codes for those little birdies. So okay. instead of writing morning dove, she's writing modo just as a um, as a little space saving device. Birders actually have a very specific system of changing every bird name into a four letter code. So if it's a two word thing, you just take the first two letters of it. So morning dove, M O D O. Um, yeah, for the most part, it's the American Ornithological Union uh, abbreviation system that's used when you're doing bird surveys. So I learned that when I was doing biological surveys, you, you can do them really quick. So that, that's good data. That's, that's, that's really cool. Um, are there any other quantification pages that you wanted to, to share? <laughs> Um, let's see what everybody else has. Okay, great. Um, so does anybody else have a little quantification moment that you um, might want to share with us? By the way, as educators, one way we can really help all of our students is just ourselves, just be more intentional about bringing more quantification into whatever it is that we're doing. And then our students will see us doing that and we're like, oh, that's what we do? I can get down with that and they'll do it too. I think this might, oh, sorry. Oh, Mary. I think this might be in on the Beatles website, but I like using the one where I think it's called zoom in, zoom out. At your starting point, you look, you pick an object in the distance and you journal about it from that spot. And then you take, you know, 20 steps, a hundred steps, whatever your distance is. And then you re-journal about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, th that is, that's a really, uh, it's a wonderful exercise. Um, and that helps you intentionally think about different scales on, on your journal, uh, which reminds me also of another trick. Let me grab something out of this case here. Um, let's say you've drawn in that zoom out, zoom in, zoom out activity, you drew the little snail shell and you drew that um, larger than life size. All right, check out this little trick. This is kind of fun. Um, ba -ba -dum. So if in drawing this, to help me kind of get the, the, the detail into it, I drew it this big. All right. Um, I could get out a ruler and measure it. By the way, let's start using metric rather than inches. Um, and say that this is 25 millimeters. But another really cool way to do it, let's say you don't have a little ruler with you, is you can use this as a little measuring tool. So look at this. If I take this and I I'm going to go once, twice, three times. So that's about three and a half times, right? See what I did? Once, twice, three times, and then there's about half one less. Um, I'm going to say that this is 3.5. Um, it's multiplied by 3.5 times. So it's 3.5x magnification. You can figure out what your magnification is just by using the object across it. 
if the real object is two times bigger, it's, it's actually, I'm going to put my x over on this side. So 3.5x, uh, 3.5 times bigger. Um, or if I just took two, then it would be two times bigger. Isn't that cool? Um, or if I just did it a little bit bigger, all right? You know, I had it this big. All right? I can just kind of go, uh, okay, that is 1.5 times, all right? 1.5x. And so you're just using that little guy as your measuring tool. Pretty slick. Um, just I'll show you a little bit of my kind of quantification toolkit, things that I always bring with me into the field. Um, one is I bring, a, you can see just totally beat up here, a little metric and inches ruler. The inches side is really, really unused. This metric side I use all the time. Um, these inches are just so large that it comes kind of clunky to measure things with. And the um, centimeters or millimeters will more often than not be more useful to you. They also kind of go in groups of 10, which is useful. So if you're putting something like inches, it goes, they are in sixteenths. And that, so there's 16, 16 little uh, segments in here. And then those are put in groups of 12 in a foot. And then three in a, you know, just 16s to 12s to threes is a pretty crazy system. But with the metric, it's 10, 10, 10, 10. Um, so it's, uh, it'll, if you get in the habit of using metric, you'll be much, much happier. Another tool that I find very useful is a retractable sewing measuring tape. And this is the official, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of measuring tape. Um, and so you can get these things at uh, art supply stores. We will be selling these uh, soon on johnmuirlaws.com. Another quantification tool that is a kind of a weird one, but once I added it to my kit, I found a million places to use it, is this. It's called a goniometer. And I can use it just like a longer ruler, right? So if I want a longer ru uh, ruler, I can, I, I, I've got it right there, all right? And that will take me all the way out to 36 uh, centimeters. And that's useful. But this is used by physiotherapists to measure the amount of motion in somebody's joint. It's called a goniometer, and it measures angles. And so I, if I've got you know, branches that are kind of coming off a tree like that, I can hold this up and kind of look through it and sort of center this on the tree, come up the angle, and I can get, I can then read off this dial what that angle is. Um, or another time I was out at a pond, and I was looking at, these at, at iridescent colors on the heads of ducks. And so, and what I discovered is if this is me and the sun is here and I'm looking at a duck that is here, then its head was purple black. But if I looked at a duck that was over here, it was blue green. And if I looked at a duck that was over in this direction, it was bright green. So depending on, if I put myself lined one of these up with the sun, I could figure out what is the exact point in here at which the angle from the sun to the duck, it changes from purple to green. And so I would just, I would sit there and kind of line this one up with the duck. And I would get that angle and figure out, you know, it was really, really fun. So sometimes when you've got a tool, it opens up different sorts of possibilities um, for, for you. So that's, that's another 
um, useful tool. Another great quantification tool is just a wristwatch. Right? If it's got a second hand, then you can time things. Um, and it also allows you to say when things happen. So all of those are really useful quantification tools. My last little bit of quantification tool kit is the, just this, this page. And this helps me estimate percent cover, how much of something is covered by something. I've got my biometrics, I've got my degrees of arc, ruler in case I didn't bring it. If I lost my goniometer, I now have a protractor. This just helps me be a little bit more specific with, with what I'm doing. Right. So that, um, I want to just sort of uh, return to our larger group for a minute. Does, does anybody else have another quantification trick up their sleeve? Uh, Heather's got something for us. Or at least she's um, nodding her head. Yeah, so one of the Nature Journal Club's, uh, Brian's, uh, that he does on Saturday, he had us, this was so much fun. He had us with a card cut out a little square. And so we looked at, you know, just that little bit of whatever we could see inside the square. And it was awesome. So I picked the leaf and then, you know, I looked at different parts of the leaf. And as a way to really narrow your focus, it was just so cool. Oh, that is, um, that is and so, <clears throat> Yeah, it was just, it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, the, sometimes the big world can be overwhelming. You zoom into a smaller place, that will be a little bit easier to handle, and you'll find just as much wonder and mystery in this much of the world as, as, as that, if you know how to look. Um, somebody asked if that quantification page is available. That's a free download off of my website. So you can go there and down, or it's in How to uh, Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, and you can photocopy it out of there. But um, probably the easiest way to do it is just to, to download that, and then you get it in your book. Uh, Jack, so Jen and Jess both had comments. We're waiting. Yes. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> So um, I was, uh, I had a couple of different things that, that came up in my head. Um, one of them was like your goniometer, uh, just using a regular old um, protractor from a school geometry set is actually the same size as the credit card. So it'll just fit in your wallet, which is pretty handy. <laughs> oh. I got called out as being a big nerd the other day when I went to pay for something and it, <laughs> there was a protractor in my wallet. So. Um, but that's a badge of honor, isn't it? Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing, a couple of other things I wanted to um, ask really quick. I had to, I had to like run out with my dog in the middle of the lecture. So I don't know if you mentioned it already, but your um, stem and leaf plot that you have on page 54 of your, um, of your nature drawing and journaling book um, is so useful for just like a, like a boatload of data that you can just jot down really quick and then see really overarching themes like your mean, your median, like that kind of thing. Um, so if you could talk about that one, um, maybe oh, briefly. You, you're my new best friend because I love <laughs> the salmon leaf plot. It's, yeah. it's this thing that, that should be in, in everybody's vocabulary, but for some reason, I've just found a handful of teachers who teach it. Um, but it is so deliciously useful. Um, we spend a lot of time doing calculus in math classes and no time doing statistics. Um, but I think that statistics is one of, is, is in, in American education, is one of the huge glaring missing pieces. Um, and uh, you know, and, and so we're able to get away with th people of even politicians getting up in front of us and giving us anecdotes instead of data. And we're not trained to look at data. Um, but if we, uh, so the stem and leaf plot is a great way to help your brain start to see data. And when you collect a bunch of information, 
it will draw a picture for you, which instead of having to, if you did ever take a statistics class, it probably wasn't that much fun because you probably spent most of your time just learning how to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Um, so what is sort of the central tendency of data and the spread of the data? Those are really useful things. But again, you can get wrapped around the axle about how do you calculate it instead of what is the idea and how do I use the idea? So check out the stem leaf plot. I love this thing. Oh. Hey, Jen, Jen, do you have your protractor? Several people said. Oh, oh, oh yeah. They, yeah, uh, yeah, I gotta go. It's like in my purse in the other room. So I can, I can possibly go grab it. And yeah. I'm hoping oh, do, that do, it's do, still do. in there. I'm do. hoping that it's still in there. Um, another a thing that I wanted to say before, um, before I run off to go find that um, is that I feel like your comment earlier about um, how some people when they were growing up had some um, negative experiences with math made them phobic of numbers. I feel like we, a lot of us either had that with math or with art. Mm -hmm. And so um, for the people that we try to teach how to draw, um, numbers can be like the gateway into getting them into journaling um, for, for those people and then vice versa. Um, for myself, I'm, I'm somebody with the math phobia. So like, I'm, I'm comfortable drawing, but don't really have the math as much. So she's downstairs. Yeah, sorry, um, roommate. Um, but yeah, the, um, uh, yeah, we, I, so we either had that with math or with art. And so for myself, like I'm comfortable drawing, but I don't have um, as much comfortability with numbers. And so I, I find that like, using measurements and things to help my art get better um, has been a way to sort of branch into like, feeling better about, about, about numbers in general. Um, yeah, I, I think I had one more thing that I was thinking too, but I can come back to that. Um, I need to go find my protractor, apparently. <laughs> um, and uh, you are going to set up your stem and leaf plot so we can maybe do that at the same time. Yes, that sounds good. Okay, okay. I'll leave you okay. that and I'll be back in a minute. But, and I'm hearing um, strange noises from the kitchen. One second, Karen. Um, girls, is everything okay out there? Yeah? Um, are you guys making good decisions? Okay. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, <laughs> So check this out, stem leaf plots, so beautiful, 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 beautiful things. So you are um, out in a meadow and you're looking at the height of a flower and um, the, 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 these plants, the first one you measure, it's, it's 35 centimeters tall, right? So this is one data point. But we all know once you start measuring more around that meadow, you're going to get a bunch of numbers. So if the next one, maybe it's 45, and the next one is 42, and the next one is 37, and the next one is 28, and the next one is 40. And you know, you're going to get this big pile of numbers, and it'll just look like a big pile of numbers. And, but what you want to be able to do is to look at this and kind of figure out what is the average of these, you know, what is the, what is the, you know, some, uh, an indication of what is, what most of them are like, and what is the spread of that look like? And it's really hard to get that from looking at a bunch of numbers like this. So, check this out. Let's say your first one was 35. I'm going to put my 10s here and I'm going to put my 1s over here. The next one is 5, all right? And the next one was 45. And then the next one is 42. And the next one is 37. And the next one is 28. And the next one is 40. And the next one is 52, and the next one is 61, and the next one is 73, and the next one is 54, and the next one is 49. You see what is starting to happen? I, as long as I kind of keep these in rows this way, 
my data, as I get more of it, makes a picture. So hold the phone. You see what's going on here? We just made a picture out of a pile of numbers. And in this, you can get a sense of what the central tendency of the data is. And notice that out on this end, there's sort of, there's a tail. Oh, then there was even an 86 one. Wow, isn't that interesting? So um, why you, your data has a shape to it. So think of it this way, right? Right? And you see the shape of your data set. Isn't that beautiful? Now, if um, you are get really good at statistical calculations, you can learn how to take a whole bunch of numbers and compare two populations. Um, but with Comparing to, like, let's say this was in the meadow, and then you go up to the ridge top, and you start doing the same thing. And the first one is also 35, but this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the 30 here, and this was my meadow data set. And this is the hilltop. All right, so my first one is 35, and then the next one is 22. And the next one is 11. Whoops, sorry, 11. And the next one is 24. And the next one is another 11. Oh, so I get to use that one again, great. Um, and the next one is 23. And the next one is 19. Boom, boom, 19. And then the next one is nine, ooh. So, ah, okay, it's nine, All right? So you see what's happening here? This data set is here. They're all shorter. So I can now, all of a sudden, the shape of this, the numbers, the pattern emerges to me because of how I collected my data. Isn't that slick? Um, why? We're not all taught this early on, I don't know, um, but crazy useful, crazy useful as naturalists. Yeah, Heather? You blew my mind. <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, this is, it is so useful. All of a sudden you are seeing the central tendency of data and the spread and without doing a very uh, a, 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 a calculation to establish what is the difference of means and then get up with end up with a number that you have to interpret. You're seeing the central tendency and the spread of both of these and you can compare them with each other. So much fun. All right. Yeah, uh, Jen, um, you think of your other thing. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, I did think of the other thing. Um, unfortunately, because I mentioned it today is the one like, of course, I don't actually have it. But this is the size of my wallet. This is my actual wallet. So the protractor fits in here. And like, there's my library card. It's like the same size as the library card. So it's just one of those little clear plastic protractors that you get in any geometry, you know, like the Stanford geometry set, like the little, the little one that you get in that metal tin case kind of thing, you can find it at the thrift store for two dollars or whatever lately that kind of thing and i like it. Um, your your uh library card says creative which you definitely yes are. it says it says i have a creative mind that's the victoria um branch of the yeah greater victoria public library anyway um i wanted to say my last uh thing that that popped into my head was um, one of our early uh, lessons that we teach um, with Nature Sketch up at the Bateman Foundation is um, value. And so we, you know, we talk about when you're giving something a value, okay, like it's literally a number like one to five or zero to five or whatever. And so um, 
as you're looking around you, you can sort of quantify what value are the things that you're looking at. So like what things are, like if, you're, if you say five is the darkest dark that you can make with your pencil on the page, um, and that's a five, what things around you fall under that category? And so you can make yourself a little list of all the things that are the darkest darks all around you. And like, okay, what are the lightest lights? What are the middle values? Like that kind of thing. So um, just as an exercise to start seeing things and you know, start being able to see the lights and the darks and the med medium tones that um, not everyone is familiar with when they first start learning how to draw. I like it. I like yeah. it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, Jen. Um, and did somebody else have, um, somebody else had another idea? Mine was just that, um, this sort of along the lines of the seven leaf plots that just so many graphing opportunities and all sorts of graphs and ways of displaying data over a long period of time. Um, with my group, we went out once a week to the same place every day. And um, they really loved, of everything in their journal, I think they liked best comparing the sunrise and sunset for that day across the year in their journal. And they got a kick out of it when it got back to where we had started. Um, so anything plotted over a long period of time. And I'm kicking myself now because we didn't grasp that data, which it would have been cool to see. Right. But now, now that you're getting your, your first solstice thing, you can start tracking that over time, Jess. Exactly. That was really cool to see. We'll cool. do that. Very cool. Oh, Water uh, levels or anything. And what Jess is saying about um, graphing things reminds me of one other way of plotting things, which was um, invented by um, a young woman who's a, a nature journaler, uh, Fiona Gologoli. And I call these Fionagraphs. And so I want to show you the Fionagraph. So one more graph. Um, so she'll often go out into a meadow and she'll, she's looking at the flowers. And so she, she draws the flower over here. Right, there's the flower. And then she noticed that there's actually a ton of variation in these. And so what she will do is um, she will uh, come up with a series of boxes. And um, let's say there is, Some of them are really, uh, you know, bright, brighter red or magenta, and then others are more pale, and others just have a tiniest little blush. And so she kind of comes up, she first just kind of makes a collection of, and tries to put them in order of what are all the things that you can do. And then she just gets quantitative with it and starts to um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, um, and starts to tally by these. And so you get kind of your color spectrum here, and then what are the most abundant morphs of that? I think that's a really creative thing to do. It kind of reminds me of this, but it's bringing in this different, this, this different element. So that's, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Fionagraph. Um, kind of a cool little study. And so, so this, this, is, this is a nature journaler invented system. And what can you or your students develop? And if, they, if somebody comes up with a cool way of quantifying something, what I really want people to do is to share that on the Nature Journal Club page because we can steal each other's ideas or use each other's ideas, and it's going to pull all of us along. 
Is uh, Janice Kelly still on? Because she uh, wrote on here, um, I do an activity called Habitat High Rise, which I thought was worth calling out. Um, Let's hear about Habitat High Rise. Janice, are you still on? Uh, she she's, uh, might not be on anymore. Um, she wrote, uh, Habitat High Rise, um, what is at your feet? What is as high as your knee? You sh uh, what is as high as your shoulder? What is as high as your head? The kids draw each of those categories and they get very excited about that. Oh, I like that. That's cool. That's really cool. So we're about to go all off in different directions and eat lunch here. Um, before we do, let's just kind of the, 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 the big idea um, that numbers, you know, I, I, many, as I think Jen was saying that, you know, many of us had a bad experience with numbers or a bad experience with art. And then you kind of go like, oh, that's not my thing. So a lot of people say like, you know, I'm not really a math person. I'm not really a math person. Um, so there's, there's from, Stanford University, there's very, very clear research that nobody is a math person, that there's no math gene. There is, it's a skill that you can develop by, by, by doing it and playing with it. We can start to detoxify bad math experiences that we've had by incorporating numbers into our journal and starting to play with numbers, visualizing numbers, and, and looking for those, those sorts of, of, of systems and patterns. It's an incredibly beautiful language for revealing and playing with patterns. And I want to invite you and your, your students to start to do that. And it, it will change the way that you, you, you think about things. So really, also thank you everybody for a lively discussion, some really great ideas about how to, how to play with numbers in our journals. Um, remember the solstice is coming. It's a great chance to get out there and really kind of geek out on, on numbers. Yeah. Get, yeah, there's, there's, you know, em embrace your, um, the, the little protractor carrying person inside of you and just get into it and, and, and play with it. You can, um, on, on the video that I have are directions, again, about how to use a tangent table. So, you know, here's kind of outing myself as a nerd. I now have in my nature journal, I glued a tangent table into the back of my journal so that I can use it to play with um, shadows and the solstice. Um, and it's going to be fun. So just give yourself permission to re-explore this stuff, reopen things up. Um, also, if perhaps part of your fear of, of math was, might've been, um, because of how you were trained in this, um, there's, um, on, on Khan Academy online, there are some really great, very, very accessible, they've really, they've rethought about really useful ways of explaining mathematical concepts that maybe I wish I had when I was in third grade. And you can look at those and go like, oh, that's what they were talking about? Oh. Yeah, um, I, for, I'm now teaching math to my daughters. And on some of the things I like, I think I need to go, let's go look at the Khan Academy thing. And then I'm, looking like, I'm going like, Oh, that's what's going on. Ah, okay, I, I get it. So give yourself permission to play with numbers, relearn, re see if you can make numbers and math something that you can hug again. And it will help your experience of playing in nature. Um, 